I, I failed to sh uh, share again that uh, the, the shirts that the youth group um, are selling uh, will be out back. It's the get up, get dressed, report for duty, Ephesians 6, um, about the armor of God, putting on the armor of God. And so they will be out there doing that as a fundraiser um, for the, what do you call it, night? The all-nighter. All I don't see those anymore. I try to forget what they are. <laughs> I'm so grateful that you don't. Well, thank you. Rose had this vision of the Cape for quite a while ago, and then somewhere along the line, she enlisted Deb to, to make them. I don't know. And Miss Jean, I, I learned a few things. I'm so glad the TV was invented when you were a little girl. That was, that was nice. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, and you brought up my buddy, where is he? Uh, let's see if we can get, do we have Superman back? There he is. That worked out so well, didn't it? And I actually put him on there here when I got back to, when I come to church. I didn't think of it until I come to church, so I put him up here. And so, yes, the superheroes. And it used to be Superman, and it was, and there's been many along the way that we, that we claim as victims, because we like the, we, you know, I just love those when the good guy wins, right, and the bad people are taken care of, and that's what Superman did. And that's why it was so hard for people to get the message of Christ, because when he came, they expected, they expected him to take over and take over the government, and he said he would, but he didn't say he would right then. And that's why it was so important, as the last song you sang, that we keep our faith. We walk by faith. We don't take snapshots of life, you know, because those can be discouraging. And But we know the rest of the story. Well, I don't know about you, but, you know, it dawned on me a few years later, like, I wondered, where did Superman go? Like, he disappeared. Why, where did he go? And Miss Jean brought it up. And then I realized all of a sudden that he had no place to change. <laughs> the phone booths were all gone. I went through town and they were all gone. That's why we don't have Superman anymore. Poor guy. Jesus is our true superhero, isn't he? You know, as we walk through the scriptures, I've learned to give God all my stuff, all of who I am, all of what I have. For he says, if you remember, as we've been going, I will and you shall. He decides to work through people. I hope you're getting that message as we go and we've looked all at all Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and Joseph, and all those people, and now into Moses. God has decided to work through people. And his call is an invitation to each one of us to be part of something bigger and beyond ourselves. The scripture says that, and I love that. And I just, yeah, kids are just, they're so cool to me because uh, they have great ways of saying, we can get all excited about superheroes, but Jesus is our superhero, and to all of us, and when he's part of our lives, we can truly, oh yeah, there he is, right there with the big S, get excited. I love to get excited with Jesus. Well, we're going to continue our story into Exodus, and if you remember, it's a going out, Exodus, exit, it's a wonderful story, and welcome for those that are not able to be with us this morning, but you're joining us elsewhere, wherever it is, and we invite you in to take this journey with us, and for those that haven't been on the journey, you can catch up through Grace Facebook if you desire, and also I do have, uh, just in the back, I put this table talk, which is just some simple questions that hopefully you will be able to sit down with your families when you have time and, and be able to talk through some of those things and kind of just put into us the foundational beliefs. And that was my heart when I started this, that the Lord would bring us back to the beginning, in the beginning, so that we could know the foundations and know who we are and how we know who our Father is and to know who we are in Christ. It's so important. So we'll continue on this morning. Axel spent 10 years in prison for stealing. The good news is, is when spending his sentence in there, he realized his need of a savior and gave his life to Christ. He was a new man in Jesus and now looked forward to his release after paying his debt to society. 
for what he had done. When the time came, Axel was nervous and worried that he had spent, you know, because he had spent enough time in Scripture, he knew that bad company corrupts good morals and that his friends that he had when he went in there, a lot of them hadn't changed and that he would be faced with them again and wanting them to come alongside him and he didn't know how he was going to navigate that and what he was going to do. And so he, he knew one of the things that was very important is find a church, find a gathering of people that I can surround myself with that will encourage me and strengthen me and sharpen me. Down the street from where he lived was just this little church. And he thought, well, this will be a good one to go to. And so sure enough, going that Sunday, he went in. And he had a nice warm greeting. And he kind of settled in right about in the middle. You know, you don't want to be in the front. And it's okay if you're not in the back. So he was there. And then all of a sudden he noticed (laughs) to the left of the pulpit, there was this big plaque that had the Ten Commandments on it. Well, number eight of the Ten Commandments is what? I've led you on. Thou shalt not steal. Axel was a thief. And that's the only one of the ten that stuck out to him as he sat there and throughout the service that continually was haunting him. He says, I know my weakness. I know my struggles. I know what I'm going to be faced with. I don't have to be reminded the whole church service. Thou shalt not steal. Thou shalt not steal. Pray with me a minute. God, your word is true, it is convicting. It is sharper than any two-edged sword. It pierces through all the garbage, all the flesh that Lisa spoke of. Your word will get through all that. You'll get through all the busyness of last week. You'll get through all the challenges of not being able to get the workers. You'll get through of all the, the, the frustration and, and anxiety we have in trying to accomplish things. And, and in this culture right now, product isn't coming or people aren't coming or work's not getting done or sloppy work's getting done. All these things that we have dealt with this past week, your word this morning will pierce through all of that. Father, it's going to get to the thoughts and intentions of our hearts because that's what you do. You want to get to the core of who we are and who you made us to be and the truth that you would have us see and we just we want to rejoice in that and thank you for that, that by the power of your spirit this morning we will see what you would have for us to understand. By the blessed power and blood of our Savior Jesus Christ. We expect this, we appreciate this, and we know your promises are true. Amen. Well, the title of the message this morning is We Will. And then a tagline with that is First Things First. Let's deal with the right, the first things first. The other sheet that I have in the back is this sheet of God's story. I encourage you to take this sheet and to take it home. And it's kind of laid out. I got it from a friend and I modified it out of Canada. And it's got, you know, 2,000, 2,000, 2,000 years is what it's split up into. And it starts with the beginning there. You can see, and I'm just curious how much you could sit down with your family and walk through and what you can remember. It'd be kind of fun just to see because, you know, we spoke about it, the Trinity, we sang about it. We didn't speak, we sang about it earlier, the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. And it's like, okay, in the beginning was God, and so we know that there was God, and we don't quite understand the Trinity, but we have three persons in one. And then he, so we get through that, and then we look at the bottom, and we see this name, Lucifer. And Lucifer was an angel we learn about in the scriptures. And how Lucifer, he, in, in Isaiah 14, I think it is, that all of a sudden his pride and his ego got ahead of him. Well, I'm not sure when that happened. Because God said when he created man and woman, which is just, a, well, it'd be to your right there a little bit, uh, when he created man and woman, 
On the sixth day, he kept saying all along through day one, and Miss Best busy, otherwise she'd do it for us, unless one of you kids, day number one, light and all that with your hands. Um, Anyway, so he, he, he created it and he kept saying, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is good, it is very good. Well, I can't imagine he would say it was all very good if Lucifer was there causing havoc. So I'm not sure when he showed up, good conversation to have, but we do know he shows up. Somewhere between chapters 2 and 3, he shows up. And then he goes after Eve and Adam and the fruit, and so we hear the fall, we know that happens, and how God steps in at that moment. And Lucifer, because of one sin, ends up in that lake of fire that's way off down on the right. But he comes to Adam and Eve and visits them in the garden. And he says, uh, what, what you doing? Where you been? <laughs> like God didn't know. Well, they're all shamed and regret all those things. But God covers that, doesn't he? He takes that beautiful lamb, that covering, and he, he slaughters that lamb. And he institutes an atonement. That's a big word you're going to hear not much about in Exodus today because it's a real challenge when you take a book of the Bible and it has 40 chapters, which is kind of interesting in itself because how old was Moses when he left Egypt? 40. How old was he when he come out of, um, uh, come out of from Jethro's place, Midian, and went back to Egypt? 40. 80. Another 40. How many days did the spies go off and visit the land to see uh, if it was good? 40. How many years did the Israelites end up staying in the desert because of their grumbling and mourning? 40. God is so consistent. It's, it's just amazing to me. It's like you can read a lot into that or not, but it is, and there's much, 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 much of that in there. But God says he makes an atonement. And so when you choose what to cover in the scriptures, it's like, like, Lord, what would you have to speak? So I welcome you to read chapters 19 through 40 in Exodus and pick it out because it's powerful. It's absolutely, I said to Beth, that you could spend some time here, but we, we don't. God covers and makes an atonement. And he says, I will offer a sacrifice. And then we move on and the people disobey. We got Cain and Abel and we have the first murder and we have the sin. And then we see the wickedness of the people and God steps in and he sends the flood, but he saves Noah and his family. And out of that, Noah comes and God says, I'll never do that again. But he has three boys, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And Ham just dis dishonors his father. And so he gets the curse, which becomes the Canaanites. And Shem, he gets the blessing, which becomes the Shemites. And, and which the, the line is going to come from and that Abraham's going to come from. Because that's where we go then. They establish which is called the, the table of nations in Genesis. But then we go to the wickedness again. And God picks Abraham says, makes three promises, Genesis 12. And he goes through all that, doesn't he? And then so Father Abraham has these sons. And we get through where Mark brought us with Isaac and Jacob and where Kent brought us with Joseph. And we end Genesis. And we step into this event after a long silence <laughs> between Genesis 50 in Exodus 1, where God steps in and starts to speak again, and he starts speaking through five powerful women, if you remember that. And he brings on baby Moses. And Moses grows up and goes through those events we talked about. And last week, we come to where he led the people out of the land of Egypt. That's where we got. And you'll see on there Mount Sinai. That's the little mountain. Mount Sinai is where God started the law. He started the Ten Commandments. I don't hear much about the Ten Commandments anymore. Um, the plagues. I wanted to say about that because I want to make a point. You remember the plagues? It was the tournament of the gods and how God took all these gods of Egypt down one at a time and that's what the 10 plagues were about because I wanted to make a point. I want us to realize that what we put in God's place will become a plague to us. Know that. When you put something first of head of God, it will be a plague to you. 
And when you're his, he'll destroy anything between you and him. That's a promise. It's a wonderful thing. I will, you shall. That's what he says. God's final scene with Pharaoh ends in the parting of the Red Sea, doesn't it? And the Hebrews cross safely, and all of Pharaoh's army, armies perish, never to be seen again. That was the God promised back when they were up against the Red Sea, when they were complaining, and Moses said, just stand back, be patient, wait on the Lord and see what he will do. And he had them spread it, and the angel went behind them, kept the Egyptians at bay until they crossed. God fulfills his promises. That's what he did. This leads us back to where it all began, which is a powerful thing. If you remember the map, Mount Sinai, way down here. And they come up way from up there in the north, land of Goshen, out of Egypt, 350 miles, something like that. And that's where we ended last week. Here the people are back at Mount Sinai, all two million of them. <laughs> the first half of Exodus is how God brought Israel out of Egypt. That's what we covered last week. The second half is about how God entered into a formal covenant relationship with them and how he continues to bring about his promise that he gave to Abraham. And so now... Our scripture is where we ended, Exodus 19, 4 through 6. And God says to the people, you yourselves have seen what I did to the Egyptians. You were firsthand witness how I sent all the plagues, how I took and had Moses raise his staff and the sea fall upon them. You yourselves have seen this with your own eyes. You have seen this. And how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. That's a beautiful picture. Eagles are just a fascinating bird. They make their nest way up, 80 feet up high, often in a big pine. I've had them on the farm, and they're just gorgeous. And it says that, that like, I brought you out like eagles' wings. And what a mother eagle does when she thinks it's time for her little ones to get out of the nest, she boots them out. And they start falling and going. And But before they hit the ground, she will swoop down and catch them on her wing and brings them back up and places them in the nest. God is very vivid about his descriptions often. And brought you to myself. He brought them back to Mount Sinai to himself where he's going to go. We're going to see where else he's going to meet with them later. Now then, if you indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant... We talked about that, and it's very important to know it's about you obey. What did obey mean? The obey aspect of this is not about it's contingent upon you're going to get this if you do this. God has already made that establishment of what he did, was going to do for the fathers, the forefathers, and the promises that he gave to Abraham. But what he said is what the obey is not contingent upon to receive but to enjoy. Big difference. I hope I can make that clear. And I said to Beth, I hope I can make this message clear this morning because it's so powerful. God says, I am the Lord your God, and we'll get into that. Not, I want to be your God, I will be your God, I should be your God, I could be your God. God is your God. If you believe him in him or not, he's your God. There's only one God. Just because you don't believe in him doesn't take, make him not God. To obey him is to enjoy his promises, not to be contingent upon him being your God. Blessings and salvation are two different things. If I need to clarify that, talk with me. And keep my covenant, then you shall, you shall, be my own possession among all the peoples, for all the earth is mine. And you shall be to me a kingdom of priests. A kingdom of priests. What he's saying is the blessings of being, of the blessings of obedience come with being a light to the world. You get to be there. 
just came to me. I had, I had a gentleman neighbor years and years and years ago, and I didn't think he knew the Lord, and I had this, I had this, I wanted to go talk to him. He was a rough, gruff, tumbly old man. And he would sit on the end of his dock and fish, and he was kind to me, but he was just tough, and I never got up the courage to go talk to him. And one day he was gone. He was an old man. I felt kind of bad. I thought that maybe his salvation was dependent upon me. Nobody's salvation is dependent upon you. What you get is if you're available and obedient to the call, to the invitation, you get the joy of being in the presence of that. No different than Moses when he was on his way to Egypt and God said he sought to kill him. Like, you got to talk about that with your parents or with your kids. Like, what was going on there? It's an invitation to enjoy the blessings of God. Did you respond to the call, to the invitation? You shall be a light to the world. You shall is not conditional for salvation. Exodus 19, 7, 8 says, So Moses came and called on the elders of the people and set before them all these words, which the Lord had commanded. He had gave charge to Moses. All the people answered together and said, We will, we will. All that the Lord has spoken, we will, we will. They also said this a couple other times, and if you know the rest of the story, you know they surely didn't. Even though they said they would, they didn't. How many times in my life have I said, I will, I will, I will, and I don't? Truth is, God and Jesus know us very, very well. Even the night of Jesus' betrayal, when he was up in the garden and the disciples couldn't stay awake, and he come back to him, he showed compassion and encouragement, actually. It's a unique thing. He says to them, he states the truth, and he says, you know, our spirits are willing, but our bodies are weak. So he encourages them, keep watching, keep praying. What are the words that were so hard to keep? The first words that Moses went up on the mountain got. These ten commandments. Some like to call them today the Ten Suggestions. I don't hear much about them anymore. When I was a kid, and I didn't go to church that much, I mean, like the Ten Commandments were something that I heard a lot about all the time. Don't hear much about them anymore. I want to spend a couple minutes and talk about those. The Ten Commandments. Ah, God says, I am the Lord your God. Not I want to be, I could be, I should be. He says, I am. What you do that, I give you the freedom to choose, but I am your God. I am the God who created you, everybody. <laughs> you shall have no other gods before me. You should not make for yourself a graven image or any likeness that is in the heaven above or is in the earth beneath or is in the waters under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them, for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God. There is a righteous jealousness. Jealousy sometimes is not sin. Envy is sin, but not jealousy. I am jealous for my wife. I am jealous for my children. I am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity upon the fathers to the children 
of the third and fourth generation of those who hate me. What I do can impact three to four generations of what my kids are going to experience. But showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments, what I do can impact a thousand generations. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Honor the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. The seventh day is the Sabbath unto the Lord your God. In it you shall not do any work. You or your son or your daughter, or your maidservant or your ox or your donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land which the Lord your God gives you. Kids, only promise in scripture. If you honor your parents, you're going to live long. Promise. The only promise of the Ten Commandments. Don't kill, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness against thy neighbor. Neighbor, Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's house, or his manservant, or his maidservant, or his ox, or his donkey, or anything that is thy neighbor's, the Ten Commandments. This is what we call the law. I want to say that the law was never intended, God never intended the law to be a ladder and from which people work their way and climb their way up to heaven. This is not a checklist where you start checking it off. I did that one, I did that one. It's always been about grace. Always, always, always. When we put first things first, it's always about grace. Right from the beginning with the fall of Abraham or Adam and Eve, it was about grace. God stepped in, grace. They sinned once and he threw that out and said, I love you. And so he covered them. He covered them. And then he said, you aren't going to the lake of fire. I'm going to give you a way out. Right from the beginning with them. And then it was Noah. It was about grace with Noah. He was going to destroy the whole earth, but he said, nope, I'm not going to. And with Lot, if you remember that story too, when, with Lot, when Abraham going back a little bit about grace, he pulled Lot out of there. And then here we are with Moses. Grace. The story's about grace, not about what you do. The law is a reflection of life for God's people who have been saved from judgment. That's what it is. God says, I give you these commands not so you, can become, so you can become my people. Not for judgment. I gave you them because you are my people. And even today, they're not what we must do to be saved. We know that, but we poo-poo them and put them back. They're still significant today. They're a mirror to tell us how our lives ought to look. I don't steal because Jesus doesn't steal. For what the law could not do, weak as it was through the flesh, God did sending his son, Romans 8, 3 says. Don't think that I, Jesus, came to abolish the law. He says, I came to fulfill the law. It's like, man, I, I want to get my arms around this. <laughs> because there's a big, I deal with people every day, and you've heard me say it before, that are under incredible pressure. I'm not sure what to do with that. Because it's not about what we do. And with God, it's definitely not about what we do. And yet we realize we can't not do something. So where is this balance? And I say first things first. It's about priorities and what we put first. Because I read scriptures like God is saying in 1 John, everyone who practices sin also practices lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. So like, well, so if I'm sin, I'm breaking the law. And if I'm breaking the law, then I'm sinning. And I'm on this checklist again, like God's up with a checklist, and Randy messed up again. In Romans 3, 23, says, For all have but fall have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Oh my, what am I going to do with all this? If it's law, I'm sinning. If I'm sinning, it's breaking the law. And all have sinned. And we just fall short of this glory of God. But there's a, there's, a, there's, a cue, there's a clue there. 
We fall short of the glory of God. Sin is falling short, missing the mark of what? Of the glory of God. Well, that tells me, wait a minute. These, then, if this is the law, these tell me about the glory of God. That's what they are. They're not a scorecard. It's an expression of God's glory. And he saw that so significant, that's the first ten things that he talked to him about because he's got all these people that he brought out of slavery and they don't know how to live. They've been told what to do, when to get up, when to eat, when to go to the bathroom, where to show up for work. They have no mind of their own. They made no decisions of their own. And God says, now i got all these people and they need to know how they're going to live if, if under my provision, under my promises. And How do you live? Well, first you've got to know who I am. He says, here I am. That's what he's saying to him. Here I am. I'm going to come down to you and meet you right where you're at. I'm going to come and work within you right to the depths of your heart, the struggles that you have, the issues that you have, the pain that you have. Here I am. It's a reflection of some aspect of the character of God. God is trusting. Therefore, we will not steal because God is trusting. God is truth. Therefore, we will not lie. God is content. Therefore, we will not covet. God is saying to us through the Ten Commandments, this is what your life will look like. The Ten Commandments should lead us to worship, not condemnation. Knowing us best, they speak to the ten most top significant struggles of the human experience. That's what God did with them. It's incredible. The first four speak about our struggle to love God. He says, have no other gods. God knows the cares of this world will be in constant battle. It's trying to steal ground from him. He knows that. The world is constantly wanting to suck you in to make whatever is important first. And God's saying, no, first things first. I'm first. No graven image. God knows we will struggle with authentic worship. I, I got to confess to you. I got to take a minute and confess that I am a bit confused about the church today. I don't know quite what to think about it. Some have become a rock concert with a TED Talk and an amusement park all under the roof named the church. I, and I'm not sure the modern world even cares. And that can be the church in some aspects too, that they feel there's even a need of a Savior because it does not believe in a God who will bring judgment. We don't talk about that. We don't hear about that, that there is actually judgment for what we have done or not done. Some of them are responding by adapting to a message of, Christ will make you happy. You want to be happy. Everybody wants to be happy. He'll make you rich. He'll heal your family. Dennis Prager is one Jew, non-Christian Jew, that I like to listen to. I'm careful, but I, 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 he's, he's, he's got some good insight. He said it's possible with this kind of message. <laughs> and he's not a Christian. It only strengthens the atheist and does not convert the unbeliever. Because what about when God doesn't? What do you do with that? There is an element of truth in all of that. But it's not the gospel. It's not. I don't know who I even got that from, but it hit me kind of hard. I thought, they're, I, I, they're spot on. That's not the gospel. All that stuff might be true and elements of it are true. That's not the gospel. The heart of the gospel is that Jesus came to save us from the judgment of God. Period. That's the heart of the gospel. Because we were doomed to the lake of fire. 
And God says, no, I'm going to bring another way. And when Abraham was bringing Isaac up the mountain, Isaac said to him, hey, Dad, we got the wood. We got the, we got the knife. Where's the lamb? Abraham says to Isaac, God will provide the lamb. He will provide the sacrifice. And that sacrifice was the atonement for our judgment. That's the gospel. No graven image. Don't take my name in vain. God knows we struggle to speak about him to others in an honoring way. How do you talk to people about God, about Jesus? Is it like kind of uncomfortable? Like, I don't know what to say about Jesus to other people, non-believers, friends. Say, yeah, I don't believe in that Jesus stuff. I don't know if it's true. I hope I want to encourage you, younger ones, if that is a situation. It was for me for years. I think you get to the point. I had some neighbors that were just a bunch of wild and, and, and loved them in, in, in best I could, but they were just like a bunch of young guys living it up all the time, and I don't know what they, they offered me to come over or something, being friendly, and I said, I just politely told them, no, I'm a Jesus freak. I said it. I'm a Jesus freak. They smiled. They got it. You know what they said? Yeah, I used to go to church. Opened up the door, talked to him a little bit about it. You don't know. You can just say it. Yeah, I love Jesus. Yeah, but then what am I going to say? Holy Spirit says, don't worry about it. Remember the Sabbath day. Keep it holy. This is an interesting one. God knows we will battle over giving him our time. We all deal with it. Sports, soccer, basketball, nice weather, vacations, I don't know, all kinds of stuff. For us, it was horses. Girls loved to ride horses. Equestrian team had meets on Sundays. What do you do? God knows that. Those top four are the ones that give us a, a, an image about him, and it's the way that Christ summarized it, and I'll, I'll touch on that later. The next six are about dealing with our neighbor. The first four are about dealing with God. The next six are loving your neighbor, about dealing with your neighbor. Honor your father and mother. God knows we struggle to submit to authority, period. Don't murder. God knows that we struggle with hostility, depression, broken relationships, unmet emotional needs. The heart knows its own bitterness, Proverbs 14.10 says. I, I have fun. I'll ask a husband when I'm working with a couple. I'll say, what makes, what makes this little girl, his wife, giggle? I get that deer in the headlight look. Some of you guys are now. I'll ask the little girl, lady, what makes you giggle? I don't know. I, I don't know. Then I'll say, ask, what makes you cry? Almost instantly tears. That pain is as real as it was if it happened 40 years ago. Our hearts know our own bitterness. God knows that about us. Adultery, he knows the battle for purity. Stealing. He knows the struggle for honesty, balanced scales, people taking advantage of each other, false witness. He knows that we have an impulse to distort the truth a little bit. Covet. God knows being content is very difficult in a materialistic world. The law is a light in a mirror to help us be accountable to ourselves and each other. It's not a bad thing. They're an act of worship, not a whipping post to string you up on. Sin shall not be the master over you, for you are not under the law, but under grace. Sin and law, right in the same verse. You're under grace. We've been under grace since day one. The law was a mirror as to the way we should ought to live. 
to be in the full blessing of God, to say, God's saying, this is who I am. It's not that you shall not steal. I don't steal. Therefore, you shall not. It is, will not be the master over you. I'm going to jump ahead. Chapters 25 through 40, focus, focus on God building a place to dwell in with them. He wants to come and live with you. He wants to come and reside and walk with you. And if you want to read that, it's just an amazing thing, all the detail and all, the, all the, the, the things that were laid out and how that was and significant and how it all relates back to Christ, that would be a fun thing to go through sometime. And it's very hard sometimes as you're going through the script this way to not make it a, uh, a lecture or make it a, uh, you know, like a, a, a prof speaking. It's very difficult because we want to be able to bring in something we can relate to, right? And we get that. And some of us, like after a time, it's like, oh man, I need a breath here. This is just too much information. And I'm not trying to overload in that sense, but to get the picture of God and his intention, how intentional he is and how detailed he is. And I've said that before. The scriptures, when you look at the whole story, one God, one story, it's massive, it's big. But when you start getting in and peeling back the pages and asking questions, it becomes very detailed and like, Oh man, he cares, he cares, he cares. So when he says things like, I numbered the hairs on your head, you say, right. No, he did. That's, he, you're that important to him. And it's, it's amazing. So God says, I want to dwell with you because Moses, went, well, in the middle of this, in the middle of 25 and 40, uh, Moses goes back up to the mountain. He's gone 40 days. And uh, the people say, oh, man, we don't know where this guy went. Aaron, please make us something we can worship. We want to worship. Well, bring me your rings. Bring me your gold. Bring me whatever. So they rip it out of their wife's noses and they, they bring him back to the guy. And he, he, you know, he forms and fashions and he makes this golden calf. And uh, Oh my. So God hears about, God says, God says to Moses, you better get back down there. You can't believe what the people are doing. He says, I'm going to take them out. And, uh, but I'll, don't worry, Moses. I'll, I'll, make, I'll, I'll, I'll continue in, in with the promises that I gave to Father Abraham through you. Moses gets down there and he's mad. He's mad. He's angry. Like his nostrils are flaring. And he takes and he throws the tablets. And like, what have you done? 40 days, my goodness. Really? After all you've seen, after all you've done, and what God has done for us, how he's provided for us, and like, this golden calf is going to be your new God, and come down and they're having this big celebration and party? Oh, Paul tells us, you know, we go to the mirror, we look at ourselves, we walk away, we forget what we look like. If you're like me, that's a good thing. But it's true. We do, we forget, we forget so fast. Moses is angry. But you get a heart of Moses here because he goes to God and he says, God, if you're not going to forgive these people, take my name out of the book of life. Wow. Really? God said, Mo, I'm not going to do that. I'll deal with them. You go and lead them. Keep leading them on to the promised land. I'll handle it. I'll judge the people. This leads us to some life lessons. God desires our worship. He says, I am a jealous God. Offering yourself to God is what worship is all about. First things first. We will. Devastating judgment is not always so much about our sin as our refusal to give it up and repent giving God our complete heart. It's an interesting thing. Often we sin because we want to. I wrote this question for myself and for you. Is there anything standing between you and God? 
You see, much of life is waiting on God. When people saw that Moses was taken so long, they got all shook up and they took matters into their own hands. Waiting on God doesn't mean you're just sitting around. It, it, it includes an active engagement of prayer and scripture and counsel. But God will never be pushed. He doesn't have to be pried. You don't need a pry bar to get God going or to get him to open up. And know this. You may not get the God you prayed for, but you will always get the God you need. Always. Number three, it takes solid convictions to resist people pressure. Kind of showed Aaron's character a little bit weak. And kind of, well, Mo, I don't know. They just they gave me this stuff. I threw it in this pot. And look at what came out. He was right along side Moses with all those miracles of the ten plagues. And when the people put pressure on him, he fell. How is that possible, really? Well, I wouldn't. Because I'd know the hand of God and the strength of God and the power of God. And I'd know that if Moses isn't coming back down, God would tell me. No, he fell. How do you stand up to people pressure? Think about this one. <laughs> when we seek to give people what they want, through market ministry, I want to say this slow. When we seek to give people what they want through market ministry, it always ends up in, in idolatry. I'd like to hear your thoughts on that. Especially as elders... And leaders of the church, when we get together as guys, we're going through some development and, and searching it right now. It's a very big thing to us and a very much of our heart to put first things first and always come in prayer before God asking for the wisdom and the insight and his power to be upon us to confirm his message and not our own. And like, pretty tough when you work with a bunch of men, a bunch of people. We don't want people unhappy. Simple thing. That's why when we did this, and Barry, Barry said, Randy, let's get some shirts. It's okay. And then we talked about it, and I sent it to him. I didn't, I didn't put a grace name on here. We're not trying to market grace, community church. God has a longing to be with us. said, make me a sanctuary and I'll dwell with you. God will show us what to do and more and move in with us when we invite him. And my question myself and to you is, am I allowing Jesus to do life with me? Do I get up and get dressed and put on the armor of God or do I have my day planned and then just kind of sometime throughout there think of him? Or do I go to him first? You see, it's only the presence of this Jesus that makes us different than the world. And then he allows us to bear this fruit that glorifies him. And that's, that's the joy of the obedience is we get to bear fruit that glorifies him. And we get to see it and we get to be part of that. And we get to be alongside there when the miracles happen. The miracles are going to happen with us or without us. Jesus said, remain in me and I in you. From apart, me, from apart from me, you can do nothing. Daily stay connected. There's a great difference in our life of our doing and our being, our striving and our abiding. The laws of God are not a means of salvation. They're to reveal areas in our life that we would want to come to him and maybe change and so that we're not a mirror that we would like to be of this one that we serve and that we claim to live for. 
Their goal, the goal of the Ten Commandments and all the other 613, by the way, <laughs> Moses' laws that were given. And what, what's fun about that is, is that, uh, well, then David reduced it down to 15. And then I think it was Isaiah, he brought it down to 11. And if you go to Micah, he took it down to 3. So then they come to Jesus and say, what's the greatest of all these 613 laws? And Jesus says, oh, <laughs> I know the story. First four of the most important commandments that God gave deal with God. So love God. And then the last six that deal with being neighbors and how to live right and, 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 and everything. And love your neighbor. Jesus summed up the Ten Commandments in that statement. The goal is to set us apart, not save souls. Removal is only when a guilty sinner turns to Jesus as their Savior. Then sins are removed. I've used this before, and we'll close. I love the, the, the film aspect of it because it, it just is so like this was part of our culture. I guess it still is on some level. But it's this film, you know, kind of going back. And, and on here I say, I'll say to people, this is all your sin. All the mistakes you've made, all the laws that you've broken, everything's on here. All pictures of it. Jesus says, come, come to me, repent. Just bring it to me. Remember, my mom saying, now, don't pull the film out before we take it in. How come? What happens to all those pictures? They're destroyed. They're gone. They don't exist. That's what Jesus does for us. He says, I'll take all those pictures. They're gone. He says, I've removed them for my benefit. I don't see them anymore. He says, and then this law that I give you will be inscribed on your hearts. You'll have new pictures etched in your minds. It's an inside job. It's not reading the scriptures of what you can do. It's an inside job. Our Christian lives is not a matter of believing in Jesus and then trying to live our best to do according to what he says. It is his promise, putting first things first, that when we believe, repent, and submit to him, he'll come and take up residence in our hearts, in our lives. And we'll receive this power that he has that makes a difference in these battles which, without him, we are destined to be defeated. Period. Without him. It's how we turn condemnation into a promise. Well, Axel, he sat there in the service staring at that black. Number eight, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not steal. Condemnation, condemnation, condemnation. I know my weakness, I know my failure, I know what I've done, I got, I, I kept, I had to make copies. As he read and reread the words, they started to take a new meaning on in his heart. Previously, he had read them as a tone of requirement. You must, you must, you must. But now it seemed that God was causing a softening in his heart and that he was speaking these words to him. He was saying, Axel, he says, I will. Put me first. I will. Give me all that's in your hand. And he said to Moses, and I will. Surrender to me. Repent. And I will. And you shall not steal. His promise is the ultimate victory. I really trust God's promises, and I hope you do this morning as we leave Exodus.
and see how God works so miraculously in ushering two million people out of slavery. You see, life is not about explaining. It is totally about God's promises. So I ask you, people of God, Jesus loves you. Will you surrender to him? Answer, we will. Amen. Let's pray. Lord, we know as we bow before you that you are the living God. You are this God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and that you are the God that spoke to this Moses, and you are the God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you that you have not left us in this world with this terrible grip of evil, but that you have determined that no evil will stand and that if we acknowledge and that you will judge everything that was touched by evil, we thank you for providing a way for us to be kept safe on the day when you would judge all evil through the blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. And Lord, if anyone here does not know you, may you please stir within their hearts to speak to someone they trust, or even if they don't know them, just say, I'd like to know more. I hear you're a Jesus freak. Why? Why are you a Jesus freak? Jesus freak.